Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another chapter of Experiencer Interviews. And today we've got another amazing story coming to us from the U.S. Today we have Jim Wittenberger on board today. Jim is a 61-year-old Ohio native who grew up in Fairborn, Ohio. His home was in Hebel Homes community, approximately 300 feet outside the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. An Air Force Base, which has always loomed large in UFO lore, both now and in the past. At the early age of four, his home was the location where the unearthly encounter started. Here, he and his mother saw for the first time a reptilian, which later brought on the horrifying visit of Amanda Black, who threatened the life of his mother into shutting up about what she saw. A few months later, he would be abducted physically by a ball of light, which lifted him off his bed into a UFO, where he had a medical procedure done on his leg. These are but a few of the amazing events in Jim's life that we will be discussing today. So, Jim, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Now, uh, could you talk about Hebel Holmes community? What, what's that, and uh, how was life growing up there? Yeah, well, first let me start off. Uh, I'm uh, Jim Wittenberger. I was born in Dayton, Ohio, 1955. And at the moment, I'm 68 years old. And uh, we moved from Dayton, Ohio, to an area called Hebel Homes, which is located in Fairborn, Ohio. And uh, I moved there when I was three years old. And uh, Hebel Homes used to be barracks for people who worked at Wright-Patterson. And, uh, and so we lived there when we moved there when I was four years old. And four years old is when I had my first encounter. Now, when I moved to Hebel Homes, all the way up from three years old to probably eight years old, I mean, there was a whole lot of military people around. That's who lived there. You know, it was very few regular people that lived there. Just uh, they were all three quarter of the place worked at Wright Path, you know. And as the years went on, then they moved out, went on to the base because they built new structures on the base. And then Hubble Homes became a low housing project. But I lived there and I lived on 5H Street. And at four years old, uh, my mother to start with, and there's a whole lot that's happened to me in my life. Uh, Ten years old, I was taken by the Greys. I've seen a whole lot of stuff. But uh, at four years old, I was standing in the kitchen with my mother in Hebel Homes at the corner of Hebel Avenue and Broad Street in Fairborn, Ohio. And at the moment, the Fairborn Police Department sits on that location. And uh, at four years old, my mom is standing at the st kitchen stove. And they're real small houses. You know, they were like barracks. And there was a uh, part of the Hebel Homes were single square houses. And then the other part, half of Hebel Homes, on the other side of Hebel Avenue, were real long rows of buildings with seven apartments in each building. So you got your small apartments over on one side, your long buildings on the other side of Hebel Homes. And it wasn't a real big area. And uh, so my mom's in the kitchen heating up water to make her instant coffee. And I'm four years old, and I'm just, you know, hanging right beside her, you know, in the kitchen. And uh, all of a sudden, our lights flickered. And uh, she, I remember she thought, huh, I wonder what's wrong, you know. And they came back on, the lights flickered again. And she thought, huh, what's going on? And uh, before she could even think again, there's someone pounding at our kitchen door. And I mean, sound like they're trying to break in, you know. And so, you know, my mom went to the door, opened it up, and it was a Fairborn police officer. And he said, man, you got to get out of here. You got to get out of here now. And my mom said, good Lord, what's going on? He said, come on, you got to go. Get the kid. Is it just you and the kid? And she said, yes. And she went to grab her purse and cigarettes. And he said, no, come on, you ain't got time for that. And uh, my mom was still trying to get her cigarettes and her lighter. And he hollered, fire. Well, when he hollered, fire, my mom thought there was a fire. So she, you know, hurried up and got out of there, right? And so we step outside onto our little wooden porch, and we lived in one of the little square houses at the moment on 5H Street in Fairborn, Ohio, Hebel Homes. And uh, there's a lot of people that know about Hebel Homes who, you know, lived around that, that area. But uh, we step out on the porch, and the police officer is saying to us, go this way, go this way. So my mom's got a hold of my hand. I'm four years old, and we start going the direction he wants us to go. And uh, it's only one officer is all we see. And uh, we take about 10 steps 
And all of a sudden, a bright blue light caught our attention to our right side. But it was behind us. But, you know, because at first we're focused on where our feet are and we're going, we're looking at the cop, you know. But then once we got a little ways away from him, we noticed this bright light coming out of the sky. And we turn around and we see this bright blue light. And I didn't look up at the moment, and I don't think my mom did either. All we looked at, we turned around and seen the bright blue light. And I look, and there is a reptilian lizard man coming down out of the blue beam of light. He was about 10 feet from the ground when I spotted him. He wasn't on the ground yet. He come down to the ground, me, my mom, and this police officer standing there. And it comes to the ground. And it steps out of the beam of light. And it turned and looked right at all three of us. And he was only, I would guess, 25 to 30 feet away. I could see all five of his fingers, all five, you know. I could see his eyeballs. I wasn't close enough to see his pupils, but I could see his eyes, his fingers, his chest, his all of his face. And uh, he was, uh, you know, the structure was like a human. You know, arms and stuff were pretty normal looking. and uh, But his face was flat and bumpy all over. And there's a picture of it on the Internet, and I pulled it up and showed some of my friends at work and stuff uh, what it looked like. And uh, it had a tail, but it steps out of the beam of light and looks at us. Well, my mom's legs froze up on her. She couldn't move, and she urinated herself. Yeah, she peed on herself even. And so the cop pushed her, said, run. He pushed my mom right to the ground. She couldn't even run. And and she was so scared, her legs wouldn't work. And so she pulled me to the ground because she had to hold my hand. And so finally, uh, the, uh, 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 the police officer gets his gun out, and he shoots in the air. But I don't think right above us because that's where the saucer was sitting. But he shot his gun in the air to try to get my mom to run. My mom can't get up. So the neighbor guy comes out when he heard the gunshot. He, he steps off his porch a little bit and looks at the police officer and says, wow, what's going on? And before he could even say it all, he's seen the lizard man in the bright light. So he jumps back up on his porch and he almost broke his ankle doing it. I mean, he was scared to death. And uh, the police officer looked up at him and said, help this woman, help this kid, get him out of here. And, uh, man, scary. <laughs> and uh, so the neighbor guy uh, come down back off his porch, got a hold of my mom, pulled on her. My mom's rubbing her legs, trying to get away. We can't get away because my mom can't get up. The lizard man's standing there looking at us. And finally, my mom gets, is able to get up once the guy actually dragged her 10, 15 feet. I mean, we had to get away from this thing. And uh, yeah, it was a hell of a thing. <laughs> How high was the, uh, the saucer? Uh, well, as we exited, finally, we, my mom was able to get up. And the neighbor guy helped us. And uh, my mom wasn't able to carry me, so the guy picked me up and carried me. And uh, that's right before he picked me up. I seen the lizard man run up onto a woman's porch, the neighbor lady. She was throwing pots and pans at it, hollering, it's the devil, it's the devil. Why ain't anybody helping me? And uh, the reason why is because when I was standing there with my mom before we actually got away, I seen another police officer peeking around the corner of another building behind the reptilian and was waving at his partner, hey, I'm back here. And I seen him. And uh, so finally, uh, the neighbor guy gets us and he helps us get away. So the police officer still there, you know, with the reptilian. And as we was getting away, though, I, when the lizard man ran up to the woman's porch, that's when I seen his tail. And the woman was throwing pots and pans at it. You could hear her throwing the pots and pans. I'm serious. I could, you could hear the clanging going on, you know, and it run up on her porch. And that's when I seen his tail. And his tail reached the ground and was about another foot onto the ground. And so then as we get up, we're going away. I look up and I seen the flying saucer. 
it was about well the trees in Hebel Homes weren't very big probably 30 35 foot tall trees and it was rubbing the treetop <laughs> yes we was under it and when I looked up I was right under the very edge of it and I could see the thickness of the craft you know it wasn't real thin it was pretty thick looking and this particular craft looked to me like it was probably about 42 foot wide. It was bigger than the Grace craft. The Grace craft that I've seen in 66, they were always right around 26 to, to 28 feet. But this one was about 42. It was a, uh, and silver looking. It wasn't a uh, bronze or dirty penny color like I've seen the Grays in. It was more silver color and had a larger dome on top. The grays have a more, uh, they have a dome on top. The ships I've seen the grays in, they have a, you know, structure on the top, but it's not rounded. It's flat. And it looked the color of a dirty penny, copper color. And that was in 66. But yeah, so we, we get up off the ground. <coughs> Excuse me. And this saucer I look up is right there. You know, and the reptilian had done run up on the woman's porch. Last last thing I heard was pots and pans being thrown at it. And uh, so we travel about uh, maybe 80 feet and we're on a sidewalk that runs along Broad Street, which is one of the main roads that run right by right Pat. The fence to right Pat is just on the other side of a baseball field right by Broad Street. You could throw a rock and hit the fence. That's how close I live to, to the right path. And, you know, right path's got a date and address, but I think it should be Fairborn because it sits right against Fairborn, Ohio. And uh, so we get on sidewalk, and we ain't on that sidewalk not even one minute. And all of a sudden, we look up, and here comes military trucks with the big canvas covering, uh, jeeps with machine guns. One of the jeeps had a big giant light on the back. Uh, there was men jumping out of the back of the truck, separating themselves, army men. I seen four men in the front of the trucks, and they all had helmets on. It was a troop carrier truck. And I was only uh, four years old. And, you know, and I was walking along the ditch line. My mom was on the sidewalk, and she was holding my hand, and they was told us, keep going, keep going. The army men was separating themselves, and I looked in front. There was only a couple people. I turned to look behind us, and there were about 15, 20 people behind us. They started evacuating that part of the Hebel homes because they didn't want people to see what was going on. And so they put us all up in the IGA parking lot, which is only about an eighth of a mile right down the road. Well, they couldn't get in, you know, to let us in there. So they called up whoever had the keys. They come, unlocked it, and put us in there. We was in the IGA for about three hours. And the second hour, uh, well, when we first got in there, it was still a little chilly out. My mom had peed on herself, right? So a woman gave my mom a sweater to tie around her so everybody couldn't see that she peed on herself. So my mom got the sweater, tied it on, and uh, my uh, somebody in there looked at my mom and said, Edna, you seen something. What was it? And my mom said, I don't know what it was, but it wasn't human. And one guy in there was drunk. He started laughing. And the other guy next to him had to shove him and say, buddy, what do you think this is? What do you think is going on? All these military people out here. And, you know, we got generals in the parking lot, you know, <laughs> and OSI agents from Wright Pat, men in black. I've seen them come in the store dressed in suits. And I've had a few encounters with men in black throughout my life. And uh, so they put us in the store. The second hour, we heard machine gun fire. And I mean, you could hear it. It sounded like a hundred firecrackers going off to me, you know. And some guy jumped down off the bags of rock salt by the window inside the store that, where they had us all. And they wouldn't let no one leave. There was a couple guys wanting to leave and they would let them. And the people said, you know, you don't own me. I'm not in the service or military. And they said, we don't care. You're not going nowhere. They wouldn't let no one leave. And this was really serious business, you know. And, uh, so uh, we're inside, and this guy jumps down off bags of rock salt, and he goes, you know what that is? That's machine gun fire. And when he said that, that's when I realized, wow, that's what that is. I was only four, but I was a smart kid. 
because of where I grew up and how I grew up. And uh, it was machine gun fire. And uh, so an uh, hour goes by, they come up, you know, well, they're already in the parking lot, a lot of them. But they give us all rides back home. And me and my mom wouldn't get in an Air Force car. We got in the Fairborn police officer car because my mom didn't like the Air Force and I didn't either. But uh, so they take us back home and they told my mom to, you know, get, get on in your apartment. Well, there ain't no lights on. The electric, you know, wasn't on. And, and, you know, I guess it was on, but all of our lights were out because my mom, I don't know if she told somebody to go by, make sure, you know, turn shit off because she didn't know if she left the stove on or not. The police officer got us out in such a hurry. So maybe that's what happened. Someone went back, turned off all the lights, but we, she wouldn't go in. And so one army man got her and started dragging her. So my mom threw herself to the ground so he couldn't make her go in there. Because my mom was so afraid to go in, she we didn't know where that thing was anymore. She wouldn't go in. And so finally, an army man got a big light off of one of the trucks or jeeps and shined in there, reached in, and he wouldn't even go in. And the neighbor guy who helped us up at first to get away, he laughed at the army man and said, Aha, you wanted her to go in without a flashlight or anything. You got a flashlight, you won't even go in. What's the matter, chicken? And boy, you talk about pissing that army man off. <laughs> the neighbor guy, you know, and uh, who, who uh, ended up not being with us just days later. And I can't go much into that, but that pretty much just told it all, okay? But uh, I've seen him go in the guy's house. But uh, we go back home, and uh, the next morning comes around, me and my mom. My mom says, the heck with this. And we walked over to where the neighbor lady lived behind us. And the whole front walls caved in and the window pushed right into the living room in the kitchen. And we look at the door and the door's in perfect shape. You know, the, the door wasn't messed up at all. The reptilian, you could tell, busted right through the wall and went into this woman's apartment. And I suspect that the reptilian... You know, I don't know if he knew where he was going or what, but there's a real pretty woman who lived there. And if he had her it, her draped over his shoulder while he was trying to get to his blue beam of light to get back in the craft, and we heard machine gun fire, they may have took her out too. You know, I wouldn't put it past them because of things I've seen since I was four years old and been through. And believe me, I've been through a lot. And uh, so, you know, they, they, to get a hold of a real reptilian, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past them. But they didn't really care much about her life at that moment. But now whether it had her or not, I don't know. She could have been inside, passed out on the floor. I don't know. But they went there for a reason, you know. And, uh, and I, I don't know if they killed it, you know, and took it to right path. But that's what I think, you know. I really do because we heard a lot of machine gun fire. And so that happened. And then about, you know, I was only four, so I don't know if it was two weeks later or a month later. But I get up one night. This is 1960 when all this happened in Hebel Homes, where it used to be barracks for Wright Pat, and military people were still living there when I was four years old, mostly all military people. And uh, I get up one night. at uh, It was 12.40 a.m., Headed toward 1 a.m. in the morning. And I looked in my mom's bedroom, and she was gone. And uh, back in the day, after the kids went to sleep, they would go out and party with their friends or whatever they was doing. And there wasn't no laws back then about it, you know. And my mom knew once I was asleep, I wouldn't go nowhere for seven, eight hours, you know. But anyway, I woke up, and she wasn't home. So I went to the refrigerator, got me a drink of milk. And I put the milk back in the fridge, and I went to the living room, climbed up on the back of the couch, looking out the window. And out the window, I see about five or six teenagers in the middle of the road, where a bunch of roads joined together in the middle of the road, and they're all talking, whatever. And all of a sudden, I see them pointing up in the sky. And they're pointing up in the sky, and I look up, and I see what they're pointing at. Little balls of light, about the size of a grapefruit a little bigger than a grapefruit, you know, coming down out of the sky, about six of them. And they're circling each other like they're playing. 
And so I'm sitting there on the couch inside looking at them. The teenagers are po- outside pointing up at it. These things are coming down real slow, circling each other, playing around, you know. And uh, then they get about 15 feet to the ground, these orbs of light. And the teenagers start spreading out a little bit. And then all of a sudden they run. And before I knew it, there's a face at my window right in front of me, a teenager. He, he ran, you know, toward me off to the side, but I didn't see where he went. And then he, he was ducked down and raised up right in front of me in the window, scared the heck out of me. And he goes, run, kid, run and hide. Well, I and these balls of light now are in my yard right outside my window, you know, and out in the middle of the road, which is only 40 feet away. But the, the, there's a couple of balls of light right in my yard, right by my window. So I go to climb off the couch, and I turn around as, as I'm getting off the couch. The teenager guy takes off running, and I've seen a ball of light chase him around the corner. That was the last, last thing I've seen. I ran to my bedroom. I covered up with my sheet. I covered all the way up, my nose and everything. Just my forehead and my eyes were showing. All of a sudden, I see my kitchen light up real bright. And I don't know, is it outside? Is it inside? I don't know. All of a sudden, there it is in the hallway. And it's coming right toward my bedroom. And I'm laying there with the door open, (laughs) you know? And I'm looking at this ball of light that's near the ceiling coming through the hallway toward me. It comes in my bedroom. It circles my bedroom one time, a complete circle. And then dropped down right in front of my face, almost landed on my chest. A moment later, I started raising up off of my bed with my sheet still draped over me. I started raising up off my bed, and this orb is off to my left side, right beside my neck, right beside me, a little bit bigger than a grapefruit. And I get up so high. And then I start moving toward my bedroom window. Now, it's chilly out. My mom, you know, people had sweaters on because a woman gave my mom a sweater, you know, at the store just a couple weeks earlier. So, you know, it's not spring yet, but it's getting close. It was probably March, you know, of 1960 or April. And uh, I start moving toward my bedroom window, feet first. My bedroom window's shut. It's still chilly out. And I start going through my bedroom window feet first without breaking the glass. And as I'm going through the window, I see my sheet folding up on the inside of the window. You know, it's starting to come off of me, but my body's going through, but it's not taking the sheet. But I got a hold of the sheet right here by my neck. And as my whole body gets through, And then my head starts going under the frame of the window. I see my whole sheet buckled up and over top of me. But I still got a hold of this end. Well, I get all the way through the window. I pull the sheet through the window with me. But not all of it. I got about four feet of it pulled out of the window with me hanging on to it. All of a sudden, I stopped in midair. Because I was holding on to the sheet, and the orb was trying to pull on me. But I wouldn't let go of the sheet. (coughs) And so for a moment, I was sitting still, but laying on my back. You know, floating, I guess you should say. And all of a sudden, the orb pulled on me harder, and the sheet was ripped out of my hand. Well, I started floating up in the sky, real slow. And the orb's off to the left side of my neck. And I get up probably maybe 40 feet, getting up pretty high above the rooftops, you know. And I turn to see what I'm on because I feel I'm being supported. So I turn to see what I'm on, and there ain't nothing. There's nothing under me. And, you know, I was expecting a a magic board or something, you know. I didn't know, you know. And there was nothing. And when I looked to see what I was on and there wasn't nothing, the teenage guy, he was about 19, that I seen the orb chase him. He was below me, floating up with me, 
with an orb next to him. And I'm not kidding you. He, the, 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 the same teenager, and he hollered up and said, don't worry, kid. If you fall, I'll catch you. And I heard him say, yeah, but who's going to catch me? I heard him say it. And, uh, and then aboard the craft, I didn't see the craft. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm on, on my back floating up with this orb. And so I'm looking up. I don't see nothing. And then about 10 feet before I entered the craft, that's when I seen it. It's like there was a veil over it. And I couldn't see it until I got through that veil, you know. And when I seen it, it had real long blue lights strung all over the outside of it, going from the center to the outside. It looked to me like, and this was about a 45-foot wide craft, you know. It looked to me like there was probably 36, maybe 45 of these long blue, pretty bright blue lights. You know, like a LE, like a, a tube light, you know, at a bar or something, you know. That's what it looked like to me as a four-year-old. And that's when I seen it and the big lit up area that I was floating up into. And so I float up into there and... uh I don't know, right at that moment, they took over my mind or whatever. And then the next thing I know, I'm laying on a table in a bed, like a hospital bed. And it had drapes that you grab a hold of, like an emergency room, you know, just like at one of our emergency rooms. And he closed it off. And the reptilian man was standing there with me. And he had it open a little bit, the curtain. And here come a female reptilian into the room and i could tell it was a female and she they had some kind of clothes on like a blue smock like a doctor would wear and i know how strange that sounds but they were they were dressed and i didn't see no pants of course i'm on a table all i seen was you know from their waist up and i was four years old laying on this table but the first thing that happened is the reptilian i come to and he's rubbing my forehead like this telling me, please do not fear us. We will not harm you, and we will soon return you back to your bed. That's what the male told me. But then the female come in the room, and she looks at the male reptilian. She says to him, they're circling us in their flying machines. And as I laid there, I heard this <laughs> noise outside the craft, but I didn't know what the heck it was. But now as an adult, I know what it was. It was helicopters from right past circling the craft while I was aboard. Now, while in this room, the teenager guy that I seen floating up below me, the one who ran up to my window and told me to run, kid, run and hide. He's in the room next to me because he hollers over, hey, kid, are you over there? Hey, kid, are you over there? That was the last words I ever heard him say. And I didn't reply because the male reptilian standing right beside me and the female. And uh, so after that, I blacked out again or whatever. And I believe they only had me for about an hour, 15 minutes to an hour and a half. That's what I believe. That's what I feel. You know, I was, I, I was back home when my mom come home that morning. So they didn't have me long. And, uh, I come to the next time, and the male reptilian is at the foot of the bed I'm on, and I look at him, and he's got a pair of hemostats in his one hand, and he's got a little glass tube in another hand. And I look at him, and he picks up this round thing about five inches long, around as a stack of quarters, and he held it against the inside of my ankle, just above my ankle on the inside of my right leg. And he held it there for a minute. I seen him moving some kind of little dials on it before he put it against me. And he put it against me. And a moment later, I looked up. And he, on the hemostats he's holding, I see a piece of my vein, a two-inch piece of my vein wiggling on the hemostats. And that's what caught my attention. I seen the vein wiggling because he just took it out of my body. And I seen him pick up the tube. And he put take the hemostats and he dropped the vein in the tube that also had a little bit of blood. And how they do that in air like that, I have no idea. 
But I seen the vein wiggling. I seen him put it in the tube. And then the next thing I know, the orb is taking me back through my bedroom window, put me back in my bed. The last thing I remember, I was sitting up in bed. I didn't lay back down. I didn't lay back down till it turned daylight. My mom come home. And I seen the orb shoot out my window. That was the last thing I seen of it. And then my mom come in my room. You know, whenever she got home or she came home and she may not even looked in my room at first and thought, well, he's in there asleep and she went to bed. But when she got up, I don't know, but it had just broke daylight, been daylight for maybe an hour. And I'm sitting up in the bed. I didn't even lay back down because I was in shock. I seen the orb go out my window, you know, and uh, I don't know if I remembered anything else at that moment, but I seen the orb go out my window and knew something happened. But as a four-year-old and them having control of my mind, I didn't know what to think, what was going on. And, uh, and uh, you know, I was sitting there. My mom come in the room, and my bed sheet is hanging up on the dresser. And she said, Jimmy, what's your sheet doing up on the dresser? I said, I don't know, you know. And see, she walked over to get a hold of it. She turned around to walk away with it, and it was stuck. And so she went toward it again and gave it a little yank, went to walk away with it, and it was stuck. She couldn't get it. So then she goes over to the dresser, and it really looks good. And that's when she sees that it's stuck through the window and melted with the glass. Well, so she calls up the city worker, and she says, you got to send someone down. There's something wrong with my window. And he asked her what was wrong. She wouldn't tell him over the phone. She said, you just come down, you know, come down now. You know, something, there's something wrong with my window. And so the city worker come down and he goes walking up. My mom's outside already, you know, getting ready to show him the window with the bed sheet stuck in it and the glass isn't broken. And he gets up toward it and he starts laughing at my mom. He said, Edna, what kind of joke are you trying to play on me? My mom said, it ain't no joke. And I don't know how it got stuck like that. And he's laughing and he goes up and gets hold of my sheet and he starts looking at it. And I, I'm in my I'm in my bedroom looking at my mom and the city worker, you know, and they got to hold my sheet. And I see the smile go away from the city worker's face. And he looked like, what the heck, you know, and because he thought my mom super glued it on there and was playing a trick on him or something, you know, but she wasn't. And all of a sudden, a uh, uh, Fairborn police officer showed up, and then a few other people started gathering around because the boy, the teenage guy who was taken, his girlfriend was one of the teenagers that were out there when the orbs were coming down. So she ran inside, and she was looking out the window, and she seen me taken. She seen her boyfriend floating up in the air with me, below me, so she knew. So here's a police officer standing out there in my yard after an hour of daylight, right? And uh, when my mom discovered the sheet, and now there's a police out there, there's neighbors out there. The teenage girl comes running out of her apartment, says, and she's crying hysterically. And she's telling the cop, they took him, they took him, and he ain't come back. And the cop's like, slow down, lady, took who? And this woman's, you know, she's 18 years old or so, a teenager. Her boyfriend was probably 19 or 20. And uh, she starts telling him, you know, they took the little boy here and they took my boyfriend. They brought the boy back, but I ain't seen my boyfriend. He's gone. He ain't came back. And I heard her saying this to the cop. You know, I was right there at my window and she was scared to death. Nobody would come out of their apartments right there until they seen a bunch of people in my yard. Everybody was afraid to come out, you know, because they seen the blue beam of light. And and them the orbs of light and them pulling me through my window, you know, and uh, so all of a sudden, you know, the police radios it in that you know, hey, you know, I'm over here at Five H Street and you know, there's a little bit going on. There's a sheet stuck in the window and all this stuff, and so a newspaper reporter woman shows up, and uh, her name was Jill Kuntz, and uh, she was about twenty, young photojournalist. Because uh, I remember her name because she came in and introduced herself to my mom. And I have a real good memory. And uh, she uh, took pictures of my window with the sheet hanging in it. 
And then she uh, got a couple close-ups. And then the city worker took the window out, put it in his little bed of his truck. <coughs> and uh, it was like one of them little Hushman trucks are called, or Cushman. I think Cushman was the name of them. Looked like a Volkswagen van. And then the back half was a bed where they put stuff to haul around, you know, way back in 1960, you know. And he puts my window in that bed of that little truck. And uh, the newspaper woman takes a picture of it in the bed of his truck. And she had a picture of it hanging in my window still while it was still in my house. And uh, all of a sudden, blue Air Force cars show up and black cars with tinted windows. They come walking up and the general, a general, tried to take the photojournalist camera from her. She had to run, run up the road a little bit to get away from her. She said, no, you're not taking my camera. He said, give it here. She said, no. And he said, you take any pictures yet? She said, no, I just got here. But she lied. She already did take a couple pictures, you know. And the next day, the very next morning, or no, that morning, was it that morning? Or that, no, in the evening is when we got our newspapers. That evening, because she told my mom, if I get this in by 10 a.m., it'll be on today's front page. She got it in. It was on the today's front page. Pictures of my house with my bed sheet hanging in it, a picture of the little truck with my window sitting in it. It was on the front page. Now you can't find it nowhere, surprisingly, right? <laughs> and out of all the newspaper articles I know about, I've been able to find one. And that's about a giant saucer in 66 to drop out of the sky right in front of me and my mom with some of her friends in 66 over Huffman Dam, a giant size one, about 90 feet wide, 220 foot round. And men in black showed up right then too, and they already knew my name. They already put bugs in my house and everything in 1966. But, uh, you know, now where was I? But, uh, you know, this, uh, these orbs, you know, took us. And this girl's telling the cop, you know, they took, you know, I've seen it all happen. And so all these Air Force cars show up and stuff. And uh, they took my window and they put it in the trunk of one of the black cars. And then they all left. They just wanted my window, you know. And I suspect they took it to the FTD at Wright Pad, of course, Foreign Technology Division, you know. And uh, so that was my first experiences. With the reptilians, uh, that was my awakening into the ufology field and that there is other life out there other than us, you know. And, uh, you know, I didn't ask for all this to happen to me. It just so happened I grew up right next door. I was caught in the middle of all this all the way through 66. In 1964, I seen orbs again. I seen one land on the hood of a police car. <laughs> yeah. Landed right on the hood of a police car, and the police car put his car in reverse, backed up. When he stopped, it went through the windshield of his car, into the cab of his police car, and I seen paper and stuff in his car start floating, and he started raising up against the roof of his car, inside the car. And so he jumps out of his car, the orb shoots out the driver's side window beside him, he leans against his fender, catching his breath, scared the heck out of him. His partners come flying around the corner. It shoots down the road. At, I seen it travel, you know, good 25, 30 mile an hour. This thing moved, you know. And uh, this is in 1964, next time I seen orbs. I didn't see no alien at that time, but I seen the orbs. Only one. And it landed on the hood of a police car, Fairburn police officer's car. And he jumps out. He's about to have a heart attack. Well, his buddies stop. They see him. They, he, they say, what's wrong? You know, are you okay? He says, no, I'm not okay. And they said, you know, well, what's wrong? And he could not even hardly tell him. He said, there's something down there, and I don't know what it is. And they looked at him like, what? What are you talking about? He said, there's something down there, and I don't know what it is. Arm yourself. And so I seen them both pull their guns out before they got back in their car. He said, you know, arm yourself now. And they drove down there. And I'm standing at my door at this time, it's 1964, and I'm living up in one of the long rows of houses now. We had moved from where the reptilian encounter was, but only, you know, a few buildings away, still in Hebel Homes. 
and I'm look, standing there looking out the door. It's dust dark, <coughs> and this ball of light's glowing on the hood of this police car, you know. These other cops ask him, what's the problem? They go down there, right? I see both of them take off, go down that way. It wasn't three seconds later. Here they come back in reverse, getting the heck out of there. They about wrecked into each other. And then they, uh, the first police officer took his car, blocked A Street. The second cop took his car, blocked B Street. The third cop took his car, blocked C Street, which all led down to that circle where the teenagers were standing, where all the roads joined together, down where I used to live. But now I'm up in the long row of houses watching them block these roads that lead down to where the reptilians were in 1960. And here they are back again in 1964. It had to be the reptilians, I'm thinking, came back to the same, maybe to get me again. I'm serious. I think they came back to get me again, but we had moved. And so I see these cops block the roads, you know, and uh, then all of a sudden, here we go again. Here comes blue Air Force cars, black cars, military people. They make the police officers get out of the way. They go down there. The police officers stay up there by the road, you know, where I can see them for a little while. And one police officer, he pissed himself. They were standing by the uh, phone booth, and he was so scared when they came back that he actually pissed himself from what he seen. You know, but where I was located, I couldn't see what they seen. And, you know, I'm looking across the street. There's a few buildings and they was out of my sight. They was down by where I had the first encounter in 1960, which wasn't far, just a few buildings away. But I couldn't see what was going on. And uh, but I see all these black cars go down through there and all. They make the police officers leave. The military takes over. They're there for an hour or so. And then they all leave. That's all I know. 1964. Then in 1966, I, uh, I'm, me and my mom is up playing cards. And 1966, it was July. It was July, let me think, it was July 28th of 1966. And, uh, and I had already been taken by the Grays on July 25th and brought back. They had me for two days. But what I'm getting ready to tell you about now is what I seen out my window after they had me and brought me back. They had me for two days. When my mom sent me to the store, they got me on the way back home. And they, my mom had police out looking for me for two days. They couldn't find me. Cops come to the house. When I did come back, they said, hey, kid, where you been? I said, well, my mom sent me to the store 20 minutes ago to get her cigarettes. They said, yeah, kid, but you've been gone for two days. And I looked at them like, you know, you're crazy. I've only been gone 20 minutes. I got my mom's cigarettes, you know. And that was in 66. Well, just a few days later, on July 28th of 66, me and my mom's playing cards. And she goes to the youth bathroom. I go to my living room couch, just bored. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, 2.30 in the morning. I'm looking out the window. And uh, I'm looking out the window. There's nobody around, nobody out, no traffic. And all of a sudden, I look at the phone booth right across the street from me where the police officers were when I noticed the one had peed on itself the day before and or, or a time before. And uh, I'm looking at over there at the phone booth in the city building, and I see something sitting above the tree. And as soon as I seen it and realized I seen something, it started moving. And it didn't have no lights on it, none at all. And it moved right over top of the city building, probably 70 feet from where I was, right across the street. I could see it real well, but it's dark out. It's 2.30 in the morning. I'm waiting on my mom come out of the bathroom. We're playing rummy and blackjack at the kitchen table. And uh, I see this craft. And it's flat across the top, about 26 foot wide, maybe 28 foot, under 30 foot for sure. And... Uh, you know, it's just dark looking at the moment because I really can't see it. There's no lights on it. And it travels real slow, about three mile an hour, barely moving, you know. And, you know, most people think you see a flying saucer, it's always traveling at real super fast speeds. That's not the case. You know, they travel. I've seen them do five mile an hour, three mile an hour, you know. 
I've seen several flying saucers throughout my life, even in my 20s and 30s, and it never brought back what had happened when I was a kid. That didn't come back until I was hypnotized and stuff. I got hypnotized for three hours. But uh, but there's so much to my story, I get tracked off and stuff. And uh, But uh, in 1966, I'm, uh, uh, I'm looking on the couch, and I see this craft go over my friend Rita Farley's house. And all of a sudden, yellow lights start circling it around the center brim of it. And then a blue beam shoots down in the yard of my friend Rita Farley right across the street. I'm 10. She's 12. She's my friend. I just met her a year ago. You know, they lived there for a year or so. And uh, and I see Mr. Farley come out on his porch and he's because he's seen the bright light in his yard. He looks up. He sees the flying saucer. And he goes, hey, honey, come here and look at this. Well, then Mrs. Farley comes out and looks at it. And they go running back in because they see two little things coming down out of this craft. There's two little things. And I can't tell what it is because they're across the street and these things are so little. It was two grays. You know, the worker bees, the clones. Not the real grays, but the clones, the ones they send out to get people. And uh, But I couldn't tell what it was. And Mr. Farley and Mrs. Farley, they run back in their house, slam the door. When they did that, I heard my friend Rita scream. And then a few minutes go by, I don't see nothing. And then I see my friend Rita. No, I see her dad in the blue beam of light being pulled up in the blue beam of light. And then a, a couple minutes later, I see my friend Rita being pulled up into the blue beam of light. I watch both of them get sucked right up into the flying saucer, right across the street. Then I see Mrs. And I don't know where they come from. I didn't see them come out the front door. So I don't know if the Grace took them through the side wall with them and brought them around the other way, you know, and I just didn't recognize it at the time. But all of a sudden, I just see them in this blue light. And then I see Mrs. Farley and her two five-year-old kids, Billy and Ann, Rita's little brother and sister. And they're sideways being pulled up into the craft. The girls at the top, the boys at the bottom. And as they was entering the craft, I've seen Mrs. Farley. Her name was Sally. I've seen her turn her head, holler down at her son named Billy, who was five, and she hollered, hold on tight. And he was the last one I've seen go into craft. I've never, ever seen him again. And that was 1966. And, uh, you know, me being taken by the Grays when I was 10, uh, by, and they had me for two days, they had taken me underwater and through a cavern. And then uh, up into a, you know, through a waterway, like a tunnel. And I remember another saucer passing us. And I remember the grays and the other saucer waving at the ones that was in the saucer I was in. I'm serious. And it was like, hi, <laughs> here we go, you know. And we passed them. We passed each other, you know. I was going in. They were leaving. And uh, we traveled through this waterway in a tunnel. And we come to a wall. And then we raise up out of the water, and it's an open cavern. They got me out of the craft, and I turn around, look, I see like levels of rock, like slate rock, and there's flying saucers sitting on these levels of rock. And I see grays on top of them, and it looked like they had rags in their hands wiping them clean. It looked like they were cleaning them. You know, I was 10 years old, and I've seen them on top of these craft. There was about seven flying saucers in there. And they had some kind of amber light, like an LED light up in the left-hand corner. that looked like it was probably eight foot tall, four foot wide. And with some kind of light they had in there that threw off a yellow-looking amber to the room, to the open area I was in. Well, they walked me over to this. I thought it was a wall. I don't know. It looked like a concrete wall with scooped out marks in it. They had these babies. They had babies there. And they had real bright, pretty blue eyes and small mouths, real small noses, you know, almost like the grays, but you can see their nose. They looked more, I was going to say they looked more human, but they looked half and half. You know, they looked half like a gray 
except for their eyes weren't as big as the grays. Their eyes were bigger than the humans, but not very much. And the grays standing next to me said, please touch the baby. They must have the human touch to survive. Please help us. So I reached up to rub my hand over the baby's forehead and saw his face. And it reached up and grabbed a hold of my wrist like that. And it scared me. It scared me bad, you know. And uh, I jerked away. And the gray looked at me and said, no, no, don't be afraid. Please help us. Our kind is dying. Please touch them. Yeah, it said our kind is dying. It said, please touch them. They just need the human touch to survive. Don't be afraid. It's okay. They're just babies. So then I reached back up again. I rubbed the baby across his forehead and his face, and I seen a smile. I seen a smile come on his face, and it didn't want to let go of me. You know, it had to hold me again, and it didn't want to let go. And they moved me to the next baby and had me do the same thing. And to the next one, had me touch it. But I don't know how many I touched. I don't remember how many. But I turned and looked to my left, and my neighbor lady who lived three doors down, her name was Dorothy Burton, she was touching the first baby that I was touching. They had her, my neighbor lady. Yeah, Dorothy Burton, who lived at the very end of the row of the houses I lived in. I recognized her. And, uh, but then when all this was over and I was brought back home and then she was brought back home, she come running into our apartment and said, Edna, Edna, you got to help me. And my mom said, good Lord, what's wrong? She said, I don't know, but something happened. And I'm sitting there already. They done brought me back four or five hours before they did her. And uh, but nothing come to my mind. I didn't remember just seeing her five hours ago aboard the craft. You know, I didn't remember none of it, not nothing. And uh, she, she was telling my mom, you know, that, that something happened. And she said, Edna, did I stay last night here? And my mom said, no, you didn't stay the night here. And she said, well, I've been somewhere and I don't know where. And Ed thinks I was out cheating on him. <laughs> Her husband thought that maybe she was out partying or something, you know, because she never came home. But she was taken by aliens. So people out there, if your old lady don't come home one night, maybe she was taken by aliens, you know, because I've seen it done. You know, it's just like Mount Shasta, you know, the, the, uh, Dave Palentis, or uh, what's his name, David Politis. I met him up in Cincinnati just a few months ago. I went to a UFO conference up there for four days. I met him. I met quite a few very interesting people who was in this field. And he wrote the book, uh, Missing, is it Missing 911 or Missing 411? But it's about the missing people in all the state national forests that come up missing. And uh, as Mount Shasta is one of the famous mountains where people come up missing. And Yosemite Forest, you know, out, out west, you know. And, uh, but, you know, I know quite a bit. But, yeah, I, and, you know, I pretty much stay to myself, though. But I have great friends in uh, Dallas. Uh, Les Belez, I want to mention, from MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. I got a hold of him in 2008. And he now heads up OPUS, the Office of Special Organizations for Paranormal Understanding and Support out in Dallas, Texas, OPUS. And he'll help anybody. If you log on to opus.com, I believe is what it is, they're willing to listen to anybody's story. Lester Velez. And he's got other people helping him. But uh, uh, him and Terry Lovelace, they're on the documentary that we're working on. It's almost totally done. They're working on it out in Dallas, Texas. And uh, Les Velez, he lives in the town next to Dallas, Texas, uh, real close. And uh, if I could, I'd like to show books because I know we came on the air a little after I showed them already. And I'd like to show a friend of mine's book, Alien Agenda by Jim Mars. And that has been a top seller for years and years. Uh, Jim passed away in 2017, had kidney failure. And then uh, my friend who helped me all this time from MUFON and heads up Opus, Les Velez, the unknown other. 
he wrote this. This has only been out for uh, maybe 10 months or a year. And then uh, I'm sure a lot of people know about Terry Lovelace. He's been on many radio shows also. His book, The Reckoning, uh, Devil's Den, The Reckoning, that's a real nice top seller. And they're all really nice books. And I have my own book, but it's not published yet. And uh, it's next door to Central Command, The Abductions, 1966. And I just haven't got around to getting it done yet. And like I say, I, I don't know computers well, and you got to pretty much know that to get stuff like that done. But, but yeah, I've been through a lot, and I've seen a lot growing up next door to Wright Pat. And thank God I'm down in Clearwater, Florida. I'm far away from Wright Pat, and that's where I want to stay. <laughs> Can yeah. I uh, ask you a few questions? Um, sure, sure. The, uh, you didn't get into the story where the men in black actually threatened your mother. Oh, yeah. Yeah, after the reptilian, the very first encounter, when they put us up in the IGA, then they took us back home. My mom was afraid to go in. They didn't show up that morning because we stayed up all night. And the Air Force, you know, they went to the neighbor's house behind us where, you know, she was throwing pots and pans at it, where the wall was pushed into the kitchen and living room. Me and my mom seen it. Well, they show up and they went over there. They seen us looking out the window. After they left, me and my mom went to bed. And uh, it was the very next morning, a knock at the door. My mom opens the door, and it looks like an insurance salesman. And she said, can I help you? He said, yeah, could, could I come in and talk to you for a moment? My mom said, well, who are you? He said, well, just, just ma'am, let me step in a minute, and I'll, I'll tell you who I am. I'll explain, you know. And so she thought it was an insurance salesman. He was dressed in a nice suit. She, was, she wasn't scared or nothing, you know. Looked like a decent guy, you know. And so she let him in, and I'm standing there, and uh, he, he uh, sits down on the couch. My mom sits down on the couch. I'm, I'm uh, four years old at the time. This is the first encounter before the orb took me through my window. This is the very first sighting in 1960 with the Draco reptilian. And uh, he sits down, and he t starts talking to my mom about the economy. And like if, you know, you got a tree, and it's got one bad apple, well, you got to get rid of that apple or it will ruin the whole tree. And talking about the economy, my mom said, well, who are you? What are you talking about? And he goes, well, we know you've seen it. And we can't have anybody talking about this stuff. That, that's why I'm telling you about the way the system is, the way things would fall if people knew that this stuff was out there. And I'm sorry, ma'am. But I have to exterminate you. And that's when my mom jumped up, grabbed the phone. He ripped it, got up, ripped that out of her hands, told us to get on the floor, told my mom to get on her knees and pray. And my mom told me, get over here, Jimmy, shut your eyes and stand by me. So I did. He told my mom to shut her eyes. And uh, so I'm pretty sure he pulled his gun out. And I'm standing there with my mom. She told me to stand. And my mom's praying. I got my eyes shut, but I hear my mom praying. And uh, he's standing up in front of us. <coughs> and I didn't open my eyes. I was only four, so I listened to my mom. She said, shut your eyes, stand by me. And uh, all of a sudden, a moment went by. Not just, you know, just a moment. And all of a sudden, I hear him say, oh, I can't do this. I can't do this. Go ahead. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. So my mom opened up her eyes, and so then she said, Jimmy, go ahead, open your eyes. So I did, and I hear him saying, and I look at him, he's going, I can't do this. I, I just can't do this. And he headed toward the door, and he goes, they're not going to like this. And he said, listen, lady, I was supposed to come here and exterminate you. I don't want to see you come out that door. I don't want to see you peek out that window. I better not see you for at least a week. You better not come out that door or peek out that window. I cannot let nobody see you. And as he was going out the door, he goes, after all, it's not your fault you've seen it. And he left. Okay? Now, I can't say too much about the next thing, but it was the very next morning I seen him knocked at the neighbor's door, the same guy. OSI agent, man in black, from right, they came from right pat. And he knocked at the door. I seen him jimmy the doorknob. 
I've seen him go in. I heard a couple popping sounds. I've seen him come out. I've seen him take a white handkerchief, wipe the doorknob. The guy's mother came by around 12 noon to take him out to lunch, found her son in there, and he wasn't alive, okay? And uh, and so that's all I'm saying about that. But the, as the man was exiting after he went in, uh, he seen me at the window, and he held up his finger and goes, shh. And so I did, but I seen him leave. And I seen the black car go in the circle and head out of the Hebel Homes area with tinted windows. And that was when I was four years old, my first encounter. And then I had an encounter with Men in Black in 1966. When I seen my friend Rita Farley and her family taken, I went the next day because I seen the saucer stop. And I seen it tilt and start going down, look like it was going to land on the highway or right path. So I rode there the next morning and uh, on my 20-inch bicycle. And a man in a suit pointed at me and said, hey, I bet that kid's seen something. And I looked up at him and I thought, you're right, I did. I'm looking for the flying saucer I seen last night take my friends, you know. And uh, they followed me home. I've seen the black car and the blue Air Force car follow me home. Well, a couple of days later, me and my mom go to the grocery store. And while we was at the store, they went inside our apartment and put bugs in our house. In 1966, when I was 10, because they knew I seen something, because they see me on my bicycle like this, looking through the fence, looking for something, you know. And I heard the guy say it. Hey, I bet that kid seen something. And he was right. I did. And that's what I thought. I thought, you're right. I did. You know, <laughs> and uh, they was up on the roof of this building, Tatum Buick, hanging tarps over the building because the saucer had hit the building and a light post. And the white post fell over on top of brand new cars and all light bulbs busted everywhere. <coughs> so a couple of days later, I'm in the living room watering my mom's flowers in, in her little flower pot. And I find this button looking thing. And this button has a bunch of little holes in the front of it. And, but it's bigger than a button. And I pick it up. And I realized what it is. At 10 years old, I know that's a bug. That's a bug the secret agents use. So I went to the kitchen. I tapped my mom on the shoulder. I said, Mom. And I held it up in a circle in my finger. Look at this. And she said, what is that? And I, I told her, shh, be quiet. And I whispered in her ear, that's a bug like secret agents use. And she goes, what? I said, yeah, it's a bug. And she looked at me like, what's going on? You know? And so I held it up in front of me. I go, I found your bug. <laughs> and I put it on the floor and I stomped on it. But I let them know I found it. Even as a 10-year-old, I knew somebody was listening. And they didn't like that. Okay? So now, a day later, I'm outside, broad daylight. 8 a.m., I'm on the sidewalk on Broad Street, and I'm flying my box kite. Here comes Army Jeeps down Broad Street from the main entrance of the base off Route 235. And there's many entrances to Wright Path. There's about three entrances right off Broad Street and the main entrance off Route 235 around the corner from Hevel Homes. And I'm on the sidewalk, laying in the ditch, you know, and I'm looking up at my box kite flying it. Here comes all these Jeeps and military trucks. And all of a sudden, there's a flatbed truck. And I look, and, and there's no traffic nowhere. Two lanes one way, two lanes another way. No traffic. And I look, and there's this perfectly round-shaped flying saucer covered up with a green tarp sitting on the flatbed truck. I know what it is. I seen it just three nights ago, you know, or whenever, you, right before you followed me home, you know. And here they are transporting it from one part of the right path to the other. And the reason why is because on right path property, their streets are so narrow, they couldn't get it to the other part of right path. They would have had to move, you know, 100 telephone poles, you know. 
So they had to bring it out in public. So they blocked off part of Broad Street up near Route 235. They blocked off Route 444 at the far end of Broad Street, no doubt. Probably blocked off side streets where people couldn't get on Broad Street while they brought it down Broad Street. Well, I get up out of the ditch and I'm standing. <laughs> I'm 10 years old, 1966. And I'm standing there looking at all these military jeeps, flatbed truck with this big round thing. And I'm thinking my friend Rita's inside there, you know, or they already got them out. And uh, there's black cars. So as the black cars go by me, and I already know they followed me home, I follow them with my eyes. And I stare right into their tinted windows. Let them know, I see you. <laughs> and maybe I shouldn't have done that because that even pissed them off more, okay? So then the same year in 1966, about uh, I got the article in my book. You can get it. That's the only article I could find about the giant one that dropped out of, over Huffman Dam when I was in the backseat of a Cadillac, me and my mom with her friends going into Dayton, Ohio. And it was, you know, it was only 11 days later because I remember Pat Grimes. They're both passed away now. But Patricia Grimes and Ed Grimes, they were the Ed was driving his wife, Patricia Grimes. And uh, I remember my mom uh, at, when this thing dropped out of the sky. My mom said, Pat, you know, for Patricia, she said, Pat, remember what I told you, me and Jimmy seen go over our roof just a little over a week ago? And here's one sitting in front of us, but a lot bigger. And uh, so we're sitting there, and all of a sudden the driver, Ed Grimes, and we're stopped because this thing dropped right in front of us. It ain't on the ground, but it's only 40 feet off of the ground right over top of Huffman Dam, a bridge. That goes over a big waterway, a big dam, right there as you head into Dayton, Ohio. And it's still, you know, in between Fairborn and Dayton, uh, Huffman Dam. And this big, giant gold ball. I thought a planet dropped out of the sky because we was looking at the bottom of it. But it wasn't a planet because we're sitting there and all of a sudden it starts tilting. And as it's tilting, then I could see the big, round, smooth dome on top of it. And it looked like pure gold. This thing looked like it was made out of pure gold. But anyway, the driver, he goes, wow, there's a car coming up behind us, and he's really moving. Well, the car gets up beside us, locks him up. Black car, 1966 Ford Fairlane 500, two-door, with a V8 302 in it, probably. Uh, Men in black, tinted windows, they jump out of the car. They look over at us. We're sitting still. Ed's driving. We're the only ones on the highway at that moment going that direction. Two lanes over the bridge. And then on the other side is two lanes going the other direction on, over the bridge, over Huffman Dam. And uh, it's a well-known dam in the Dayton, Ohio area. And uh, actually Wright, Patters, uh, Wright Brothers, they also used the hillside there at Huffman Dam to test some of their early airplanes. You know, they did it in Kitty Hawk, uh, West Virginia or Virginia, but they also did it right there on Huffman Dam because the hills were so big because of the dam. They used that hillside to launch from. The Wright brothers did. And they got a bicycle museum down in Dayton, Ohio, on West 3rd Street with bicycles in it that the Wright brothers owned and is still says the Wright Brothers Museum, okay? You know, right down the road from Huffman Dam. And uh, now I forget where I was. <laughs> but in 66, uh, uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of things, you know, but I did. I, I forgot totally where I was on the on the subject matter. <laughs> well, you talked about uh, the, the men in black. The uh... Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, so this car pulls up. You brought me back. Thank you. This car pulls up. These guys jump out. One's on a radio. And we're right in front of the dam, almost on the dam, but not on the bridge. And this big gold ball sitting in front of us, 90 feet wide, 220 foot around, just a big gold ball looking thing at the moment. It didn't start tilting yet. These guys jump out. The driver's on the radio. 
And we thought, wow, they must be important. They got a radio in their car, you know, a CB, you know. And the other guy's standing there at the passenger door with it open, looking at us. And uh, finally, he comes over and he asks Ed Grimes for his ID. And Ed is reluctant to give it to him because he don't know who the guy is. Why do you want to see my ID? And then he pulls back his jacket and pulls out his billfold and showed Ed a badge, which no doubt said Office of Special Investigation, you know, his OSI agent. And uh, then he pulled back his jacket and showed Ed he also had a weapon. And I want to see your ID. So Ed gives him his ID. He looks at it, gives it back to him. He walks back over to the car, you know, the man that was on the passenger side of the tenant window car. <laughs> <coughs> the driver's still on the radio, and they're talking. And they look over at us. The guy comes back over, tells Ed, okay, you just sit still. Don't you leave. Don't you go nowhere. Well, Ed wasn't about to drive under the thing anyway. You know, it's real big. We're not driving under it, you know. And uh, so we're sitting there. He goes back over. And he comes back over again. And he tells Ed, you just remember, don't you ever mention what you've seen out here on the highway today. Well, this thing sat there for five minutes, then it took off. It started out real slow. And then once it got 40 mile an hour, it took off like the USS Enterprise. It went down to a little dot in just a second or two. I couldn't even see it no more. But we're sitting there, and he walks back over, this OSI agent, and he tells Ed, forget what you've seen, don't ever mention it, and you can go. And right before Ed put the car in drive to go, the man started walking away. He stopped in his tracks, bent down, looked at me and my mother in the back seat, and he pointed at me, and he said, this is Jimmy, right? And my mom grabbed a hold of me and pulled me over to her. And we took off. And Mrs. Grimes, Patricia, turned around and asked my mom, Edna, who is that guy? My mom said, I don't know. I'd never seen him before in my life. And Pat Grimes said, well, he knows who Jimmy is, <laughs> you know, because they don't see me looking for the flying saucer behind Steve Tatum Buick because it tore up the building and knocked light posts over and stuff, you know, and it landed on the grass. There's a three-quarter of a full circle in the grass. I seen it when I was sitting there on my bicycle. I could tell it hit the pole, hit the building, landed in the grass. They came, it was right only 50 feet from the fence of right Pat. I mean, they had an easy recovery, okay? They just had to come out the gate pull in the grassy ball field that was there and get it, you know? So they got that crap for sure. And the grays. And uh, so, yeah. And uh, so anyway, you know, they bugged our house. They pulled, they knew who I was. And anyway, about 30 days later, they end up kidnapping me and my mother. I woke up in bed in 1966. I woke up, my left arm, I thought I got bit by a spider. And it woke me up, it hurt. I looked up my arm, and there's a needle stuck in my arm. And I thought, what in the heck is a needle doing in my arm? So I go to sit up out of bed, swing my feet off the bed to sit up, I'm 10 years old, and there's a man laying on the floor next to my bed. A man in a suit on my floor. And he's trying to squeeze up against my bed so I couldn't see him. But I already did see him. So I drew back my breath. I was going to holler at my mother. And next thing I know, a cloth rag right over my mouth and nose with chloroform. He knocked me out with chloroform and then finished injecting me with sodium pentothal. And there's a two-star general in my mother's bedroom shooting her in the arm with sodium pentothal. They took both of us to write Pat, and this is no lie. I've been hypnotized for three hours to prove what I say. Everything is real. Three hours, I was hypnotized by Kathleen Dean out in Dallas, Texas. She's well known, but she passed away just a couple years ago from cancer. And, uh, and uh, man, you talk about one heck of a hypnotherapist. She had me back in the Hebel Homes when I was four years old. 
I was laying right here on my bed, and I felt the ground under my feet when I stepped outside and seen that reptilian. She was so good. She had me back in that time. And on the hypnosis, I talked like I was a four-year-old. The words I used, because I was, un- I was back. And then when I went to 10 years old, telling about me being taken, seeing Rita Farley and them taken, being followed home, being kidnapped by the government, it all come out. And I talked like I was a 10-year-old. The words I used, you know. And for three hours, I laid here and got hypnotized to prove what I say is real. And, uh, yeah, they, they've, they've uh, you know, men in black, they've, uh, they've, uh, I've had encounters with them, and it's never good, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, they've got craft at right, Pat. They've got aliens at right, Pat. But anyway, so they kidnap us, take us to the base. On the way there, the two-star general who's sitting in the front seat with the OS agent, he says, why are you going to all this much trouble? And the OS agent looked at him and said, what do you mean? He said, why don't you just off them? And the OS agent said, what do you mean? He said, just shoot them. Just pull over and let's shoot them. You don't have to deal with all this. And so the OS agent slowed down. He let off the gas. And we're on Route 235 headed toward the main entrance of Right Path, just outside off of Broad Street, right around the corner from Broad Street. Uh, Wright Patterson was one mile on the left from Hebel Homes on, right, on Route 235 north. And only one mile, the main entrance from where my front door was, you know, not far. And so the OS agent pulls over. The general, and I know his name, I know his first name, I know his last name, but he's dead and gone by now. He was uh, 42 or 45 at the time because I remember hearing him while I was still in the living room being, you know, before they took us and put us in the cars to kidnap us, they were talking. And I remember the conversations they had. That's why I know the guy's name. Well, his two-star general, while on the way to the base, when the OS agent pulled off the road, he turned around and put his 44 gun right to my forehead. And the OS agent said, you know, you might want to shoot the mother first. And the general said, why? He said, well, because if the mother sees her son's head being blown off, she might come out of her hypnosis, and you may have a fight on your hands. And so the general took the gun away from me and put it to my mother's head. And then the OF sergeant said, you know what? You're not the one in charge here. I am. And we're going to do this my way. Put your gun away. So the general listened to him. He put his gun away. The OS agent drove through the front gate. The guy in the little gate, who the checks IDs, he seen my me and my mom in our sleepers, sitting in the back seat of this black car with tinted windows, you know, and a guy in a suit and an Air Force general, a two-star general from right pat. And the guy looked like, what's going on here? You know, there, there was a kid and a woman in their pajamas. He knew something was wrong, you know? And uh then I seen red and blue lights uh, reflect on the visor of the car I was in as we was going through the gate there and the guard where he stopped us. They, the Fairborn police officer was letting them know, hey, I know you got him, you know, and I followed you here, people. I know he had his lights going, you know, red and blue, buddy. And he let them know, I know who, you got them. I, I, I've seen you kidnap them. And uh, he follows us to the base. Well, I'm sitting there. They put us in these chairs in this room. And it was on Elm Street, the letter M for Mary. I looked at every street sign as I leaned my head against the window when they was taking us there. Every corner we went around, I looked at the letter. It started out with with an I. I seen an I first, then a J then a K, then a L, then an M. And on M Street, that's when they pulled in the driveway, took us in this building, put us in metal chairs in the front row. There's a tinted window in front of us. And I hear uh, on the way there, the OS agent's on his radio, and he says, I don't care what you got to do. Just get it there. And my ETA is five minutes. Just get it there. No matter what you got to do, get it there. He was really being firm with whoever he was talking to. 
And uh, so we get there. They put us in the front row of these metal chairs inside this building on M Street on Wright Path property. I know exactly where it is and uh, and what building. And uh, and uh, so I hear noise in the back room. And whoever he was talking to, evidently, they, they're there now. And the general sticks his head in the uh, back door and ask them, are you ready? And they must have said, yes, okay, we're ready. So they have me and my mom sitting in these front metal chairs. We're hypnotized under sodium pentothal, true serum. And we can't, you know, I can see and I can hear, but I can't move my body. Not unless I'm told to. You know, I couldn't do nothing. I couldn't run. I couldn't do nothing. I was like a vegetable sitting there, but I could see and I could hear. And uh, we're sitting in these chairs. And uh, the OS agent goes in the room with the general through the other door to the backside of this room that we're in, a building. And uh, the general comes back out with the OS agent. And the general has this dolly that you move refrigerators on. There's a gray alien strapped to this dolly. It was strapped, right? I've seen this big straps going right around this chest. They, they, when first he told me, he said, Jimmy, I'm going to bring a little friend in, my, in the room. And although he looks a little different, don't be afraid of him, okay? And I said, okay. And that's when they brought it through the door into the room. Then he goes, Jimmy, I'm going to bring my friend a little closer. And don't be afraid. It's okay. He's our friend. I said, okay. They put this gray alien directly in front of me on the dolly. And they said, Jimmy, now my little friend here is going to hold your head. And he's going to put his forehead against your forehead. And it's okay. Don't be afraid. Okay? I said, okay. I was 10 years old, 1966. The gray alien grabbed a hold of my face like this with his real long four fingers. Didn't have five. One thumb and three fingers, but the thumb was as long as every other finger. Real long, cold, clammy, clay-filling fingers. Held my face like this and put his forehead right against my forehead. And it was erasing my memory. And then it went to my mother and did the same thing to her. But before it left me and went to my mother, because I've seen a lot. You know, I, I'm the one who rode my bike down there looking for the flying saucer. I've seen them go down Broad Street with the flatbed truck with the flying saucer covered with a green tarp. they seen me on the highway. I've seen a whole lot more than my mom, you know. My mom only seen the saucer in 66. I seen the Farley sucked up into it and seen the saucer and I was taken, you know, and maybe the government knew I was taken. I don't know. But the grace had me for two days and uh, and I got lost again there for a minute. Damn. So your <laughs> mind was being wiped. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so the grace erasing my memory. And before, I'm glad you're paying attention because my mind, there's been so much that happened to me, I lose track when I'm telling it sometimes. And I'm getting old. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, the gray aliens erasing my memory. And before it left me and went to my mom, telepathically, it told me from its head to my head, when I expire, you will remember. And in September of 2008, I was sitting at home in Pinellas Park, Florida, in another town where I used to live. Now I live in Dunedin, Florida, near Clearwater. And all of a sudden, it came back to me. First, I remember my mom saying I was gone for two days when she sent me to get her cigarettes. Then I remember looking out the window and seeing my friend Rita sucked up into a flying saucer. So at that moment in 2008, I got up and I went to the window, looking out the window, and I visualized seeing my friend being sucked up in the flying saucer. And I seen it all over again. And then everything, everything started rolling back in on me. 
And I went to my bedroom. I sat down on my typewriter, started typing it. And then I got a hold of Lester Velez up in Los Gatos, California. And that, then he moved to San Jose, California. He was with the Mutual UFO Network. He was a field investigator for 10 years. And, I mean, this guy's smart. Lester Velez is one smart cookie, okay? And he heads up OPUS, Office of Paranormal Understanding and Support. And anybody who has encounters or needs help because of breaking down, shall we say, which I do now and then, uh, they'll help me. They'll help you, you know. And, uh, you know, he's on the film. Sharon Comorn, Terry Lovelace, Jim Mars, uh, Nick Pope is on our documentary. And it's almost done. It should be done in the next couple months, I hope. And and they're going to get it out to distributors. And then once the, the distributors get it, then, uh, you know, I'll be able to view the new copy. I have a copy of it, but it's the old version before they, you know, corrected a few mistakes and stuff like that. But, yeah, it's real interesting. I've been in this field since, you know, since I remembered it in 2008. But I've always been interested in flying saucers. When I was 22 years old, I had one crossed on Route 4 right from me, the same kind I've seen in 66, copper collar, flat across the top, 26 foot wide. My stepbrother was with me, and I said, look, Donnie. His name was Donnie Palmer. I said, my stepbrother. I said, look, Donnie, a flying saucer. And it crossed right in front of my car. I could have stopped and pulled over and throw the rock and hit it. And I did pull over because it was in front of my car. So I stopped on the shoulder. And other people behind me stopping, you know. And people across the highway coming the other direction, they were stopping because they seen it crossing the highway. And it was only doing five miles an hour. You know, broad daylight, four o'clock in the evening. You know, flat across the top, copper collar, 26, 28 foot wide, no noise, no sound, no smoke. And my stepbrother goes, I don't believe it. I said, well, you can believe it because it's right in front of your face, you know, because he heard me and my mom tell him about the 166 we seen that took the Farleys. And he, you know, he wasn't quite sure, you know, he didn't know whether to believe us or not. But when he seen it for his own eyes in 1989 on Route 4, copper collar one, the Grays, then he knew. <laughs> then, in 1974, when I was working at a sugar factory in Zinio, I mean, a buddy was headed home after work and coming in the back way to Fairborn by the railroad tracks in the A&W, there was a big silver one, 42 to 45 foot wide, 5 o'clock in the evening, sitting over top of a two-story grain building where they sold horse feed and grain for horses and stuff like that, and cement. It was a cement place, but they sold food for horses and pigs and cows. It goes right outside Fairborn. It's cornfields. You know, it's country. And uh, and this big sir was sitting there, and a couple guys shot at it with a shotgun, and it started moving, and it passed right in front of my car. It passed so close to me that my buddy sitting in the passenger side, Jamie uh, Rudd, he rolled up his passenger side window as fast as he could. It scared the crap out of him. And I turned and looked at him, and I laughed. He said, what? I said, rolling up that window ain't going to help you, you know, if they want you. He goes, what? <laughs> I said, yeah, that's a flying saucer, buddy. And uh, we watched it, and it headed towards Springfield, Ohio. And then two jets from Wright Pat come real low following it. And the jets passed it up. They circled. The jets come back, two of them, and followed it and trailed it again. I, the jets were so low, I could see the white helmets that the pilots were wearing. Yeah. I mean, this thing was right there, you know. But, yeah, I've seen a whole lot. <laughs> did um, When the gray passed away, did your mom's memories ever come back to her as well? well uh, at that point, my mom had already passed away. My mom passed away in 19, 1992, and I didn't remember any of this until 2008. Until, but, I, you know, I always remembered as an adult seeing the one that me and Jamie Rudd seen in 74. And I remember seeing the one that me and my stepbrother seen, the copper collar one, on Route 4, 4 o'clock, the flat across top copper collar in 89. 
in 74. I remember them. Oh, and check this out. And then when in 1974, just three days after me and Jamie Rudd seen the copper color, I mean, the big silver one that the guy shot at it with a shotgun, it passed over the A&W root beer sign, and my buddy rolled up the window. Three days later is when me and my two brothers moved to Clearwater, Florida. Well, on our way, we stopped in Covington, Kentucky to see a friend of ours, Pete Van Zyl, and his old lady, Brenda. And we go there, and they say, well, let's go to the drive-in theater. It's right down the road. So we go to the drive-in theater. And it's dark out. We're at a drive-in. A flying saucer passed right over the movie screen doing two mile an hour. And it was only one that was uh, looked like it was 28 to 32 foot wide, not real big. And, you know, and we seen people pointing up in the sky. But we didn't know why until it got to the left of our peripheral vision. And then we seen it because it wasn't very high. When it went over the movie screen, it almost rubbed the movie screen. You know, I mean, it was like it was sat, sitting somewhere watching the movie. I don't know, you know, <laughs> but it was only doing two mile an hour. And it was three days after the encounter me and Jamie Rudd had in Fairborn, Ohio, you know. And so that's odd. For, and down here in Florida, I've seen a couple things, but nothing real close up like that, you know, except for an orb. Uh, let's see, was it May? It was February. Matter of fact, coming up is its anniversary. February 23rd of 2010, down here in Seminole, Florida, which is close to Clearwater, I was laying in a friend of my son's backyard, and an orb came dropping out of the sky across a little creek in front of me, went back up in the air, went over my head over a tree, and went toward Lake Seminole. And a moment later, I seen sheriffs pull up, and they jumped out of their cars and was shining their flashlights down in the weeds because it went down in the weeds near the creek and was traveling, going, working its way in between the trees and stuff. And that's when I could tell this thing's controlled. And there's a ball of light traveling by itself. And I've seen this before in 1960 and 1964 when I was four years old and when I was eight years old in 64. And that was the last time I seen the orb was in 64 until 2010, May 23rd of 2010, you know, just 14 years ago, you know. And, uh, and it got real close. It got so close, I put my feet on the ground. I was getting ready to run. But it went on. And that's the only thing I can say. And I've seen things go across sky, me and my son. And I have a son who's 44. And he was together and uh, stand outside his apartment up in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, next to Clearwater. And uh, we've seen something go across the sky, and it stayed lit up. And it looked like it was doing right around nine to 12,000 miles an hour. It was going so fast, you couldn't even hardly keep track of it. And it was at the edge of space, you know? You could tell it was right up there, you know? But uh, yeah, I've been through a lot. I've had encounters with Men in Black. Uh, our documentary is a two hour documentary. Sharon Clomorn is the uh, co-producer and uh, Bob Tullier, I think that's how you say his name, uh, he's the one filming it all, putting it all together, helping Sharon put it together. You know, Sharon's, you know, deeply involved too, her and Bob. And they're putting the film together. It's got Nick Pope on there, Jim Mars, Les Velez, Terry Lovelace. Got uh, uh, me on there, has Jane Nelms, Annie Geckman. Uh, there's a whole bunch of us on there, you know. And uh, now me and uh, I and Lester Velez and... Uh, Annie Geckman, Sharon Comorn, uh, and Terry Lovelace. We've all done shows a few years back. Within a two-month period, we was all on the same radio shows. So we had a little thing going where people really got to know us all and know our stories. And, you know, Terry knows me. I know them. And, you know, they all, you know, Heather Way talked about us. Tim Weisberg, you know, talked about us. And then Tim Weisberg had some guests on who investigated Wright Pat. 
and they brought my name up, you know, in the conversation that, you know, Jim Wittenberger's, you know, been on the show and he's told us about a bunch of things he's seen there, you know. And I mean, I was on Right Path Property. And, you know, I can I care about OSI and their attitudes, but they had a live gray on Right Path Property holding my head in 1966 when I was 10 years old on the base on Elm Street after they kidnapped me and my mother. And they did something else horrific there, too, but I ain't going to talk about that. Yeah. Do, you, um, do you know if, you have, if your mom and yourself ever had implants? Uh, yeah, the Grays, uh, I remember all the board. They had me for two days. I remember they brought this device to me and put it under my nose right there on the skin part between your nostrils, and I heard a crunching sound. Okay, now I went and got x-rayed years and years ago. Uh, one of my bosses actually is interested in this stuff, and he paid for the x-ray. Well, he went in half with me. We went in halves, and it didn't show nothing. But then I remember back around 1982, uh, I got on a sneezing frenzy, and something come flying out of my nose, and I heard it hit the sink. And I picked it up, and it was hard. Whatever it was, was hard. But I didn't remember none of this at that time. So I thought, what the heck is this? And it had some kind of skin around it, you know? And now I know it was a piece of meteorite, and I actually sneezed out my implant. Yes, in 1982. That's why when I went and got x-rayed, it's not there no more. But when the reptilian took the two-inch piece of vein out of my ankle in 1960, uh, my second encounter when they sent orbs down to get people because they probably killed the first reptilian and took it to right pat. They sent orbs down. Uh, the scar is still there on my leg, on my ankle. And there's pictures of it in my book, you know, and, and all that. But, yeah, they took a p piece of vein out of my ankle. The reptilians did, the Dracos. The scariest looking thing i ever seen in my life. So scary, I don't never want to see that again. <laughs> So you believe the um, they're they're the same group, the one you saw on the ground, and those that took you on board their craft? Yes, exact same kind, you know. But I believe they shot and killed the one, you know. I mean, we heard machine gun fire, and how are you going to escape machine gun fire when you got a big light on you that's sitting on the back of a jeep, you know, and, and you know a blue beam already shining on the ground also, and if they if that reptilian. Had that woman draped over his shoulder, holding on to her, they probably, who knows what happened? Who knows? How did yeah. uh, you find out about your scar? Did you show the scar to your mom? What happened? Well, my, my mom discovered it when she was giving me a bath when I was five. When I was five years old, she was giving me a bath, helping me, and she seen it. And see, she said, Jimmy, what happened here? Did you fall down and cut yourself? I said, no. And uh, she took me to the family doctor. And the doctor said, yeah, that's a surgical scar. My mom said, well, he's not been operated on any time. And the doctor said, well, I'm telling you, that's a surgical scar right there. And it used to have five four-pointed stars along the top of the scar and have five four-pointed stars at the bottom of the scar. But the scar, those little stars, they disappeared when I was 17. But the scar is still there on my ankle. You can see it. Did, um, you shared a story once uh, about uh, cars having their batteries melted down. Yeah, and actually one of mine was. Yeah, uh, in 66, uh, when after they took the Farleys, and I, see, I watched the craft, me and my mom, right directly after the Farleys was taken. It lit up our yard blue. We get to the kitchen window and we're watching it. It goes toward a Holiday Inn flashing star, a star flashing over top of two-story Holiday Inn. And we're sitting there watching it. That's when I seen it stop. It tilted, and it went down. And that's why the next day I went on my bicycle to see where it went. That's when they followed me home and put bugs on our house. But uh, I got lost again there for a minute. <laughs> yeah, we talked about the batteries uh, melted yeah, down. Yeah. So anyway, the next morning, you know, uh, after I came back home 
on my bicycle and the guy pointed at me, uh, I see all these car hoods up, you know, in the same direction that the flying saucer went. Almost all the car hoods are up. I'm like, what the heck, you know? And I know now what happened. I didn't actually go look at them, but their cars wouldn't start. It took the energy out of their batteries. So now, to go back when uh, in 1989, when the copper collar went across on Route 4 in front of me and my stepbrother, and I said, well, there it is. You can believe it. It's right in front of your face. We got to my sister's house, and I turned my car off at a little store at the front of the mobile home park she lived in. And my car wouldn't start back up. So I popped the hood on my car, and it smelled like a run over a skunk. I, it, it smelled, you know, I smelled sulfur or something. It, it stunk real bad. I thought, what the heck did I run over? And we raised my hood, and the whole top of my battery was white looking and melted. From where it, I was the only car. There was no other car between me and it when it crossed in front of me. And it was only uh, about 35 foot off the ground and 40 feet away from me when it crossed in front of my car. The one in 89, the copper collar one, just like the Grays had in 66, copper collar, 26 foot wide, flat across the top. It looked exactly the same. But my battery was melted, you know? And it wouldn't start. I had to have my mom and my stepdad bring me a brand new battery before I could even go home. Yeah. How was the uh, the technique the Grays used to take you? Uh, Shaw blue beam down on me, and I lifted up off the ground. And check this out. When I got aboard, before I got aboard, a tree limb caught my glasses, and they knocked them, you know, pretty much like this. Knocked them sideways. The limb did. And it was like that when I come to on the bed inside the Grace Craft. And I, there's two Grays to my left. One was behind me. I couldn't see him, but I knew he was there. And the two beside me were talking. And they talked telepathically. But it must have been because I was so close to them, I could hear them. Or else they opened up my mind so I could hear them. I heard the one Gray ask the one next to it, What's he doing? Because I was throwing my head up and wiggling my nose, trying to get my glasses to fall back on my face right, and it wasn't working. The gray behind me, it reached over my head and came down and fixed my glasses. It did. It knew what I was trying to do. <laughs> it did. Ain't that something? And you know what? The, the Draco reptilians, when I was aboard their craft for an hour and a half or however long, not long, uh, very scary, very scary, scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, the Greys, when I was aboard their craft, and they was actually on the roof, leaned over and looked at me. Now, that scared me the first time I seen a Grey leaning over looking at me. I was on the couch. I got the phone something looking at me. After I took the Farleys, I looked up and it was leaning over looking at me. <coughs> <coughs> And that was after the, they had done took me. Because, two, you know, the next night they took the Farleys. The Grace had me for two days. But when I was aboard the Grace craft, I felt at peace. I felt like I was closest to God. And a lot of people don't like to hear that. I felt like I was closest to God and the safest I could ever be in my life. You know, they, they seemed... Uh, I know they're not angelic. I guess they're clones. But to me, they felt angelic, you know, like some kind of angel, you know. And I just, I wasn't scared of them, you know. And and they had control of my mind, so I wasn't scared. But And I could look around, and I seen them, and I seen everything that was going on. Seen them bring the machine to my nose, put it right there, and I heard the crunching sound. And uh, But I wasn't scared of the grace at all. And to this day, I'm not. You know, and uh, they actually also uh, one time, and it was right around the same time, 1966, I'm laying in bed, and I don't know if it was them that woke me up, but I woke up, and they had walked through my bedroom wall. Two grays. They come from outside and walk right through my bedroom wall. I was laying in my bed. They took my shirt off. 
I fell asleep with my shirt and stuff on. They took my shirt off. Whatever they did, I have no idea. But I vaguely remember seeing them come through the wall. And then once they did, then I was out. You know, they had control of me, and I don't remember nothing. So I wake up the next morning. I go in the kitchen because my shirt is choking me. I can't even hardly talk. My shirt's choking me. And I go in the kitchen, and I turn around, and I ask my mom, Mom, can you unbutton my shirt so I can get it off? And she said, good Lord, how'd you get your shirt on backwards? I said, I don't know. And it's buttoned up. The greys, you know, they're extraterrestrial, and you think they're, they got all this technology, but they don't know how to put a shirt on right sometimes. You know, have you heard of that? And they even put people back in the wrong houses sometimes. You know, they sure do. Amazing stuff. And I grew up next door, right, Pat, 200 feet from the fence. I got caught in the middle of all this stuff. From 1960 to 1966, and I didn't want to be in the middle of it. But you know what? In the long run, maybe it was meant to be because now I know there's other things out there. You know, we're not alone. We've never been alone, you know? Yeah. And I believe in the tall whites. I've never seen them. I believe in insectoids. And I did see something aboard the Gracecraft that looked like a mantis. It came, stood in between the two grays, and I felt like it was judging me, and it, it was superior. It was about seven foot tall and had a real, real long neck, and its head was real narrow, you know, and had big black eyes like the grays, but its eyes were even more slanted. And I believe it was a mantis being. That was there that came aboard the Grace Craft while they had me them two days. And it stood right by me by the bed I was on. And one gray on one side of it, one gray on the other side of it. And I felt like it was judging me. Yeah. Did you get a good sense of how big the craft was inside? That, uh, the one that I was on? Yeah. Well, the one that I was on, uh, the Grays, they're the same one that took the Farleys. And even while I was aboard, you could tell it wasn't real big. You know, 26, 28 foot wide. Yeah. Yeah, I could. I, I remember, now that I remembered all of it, I remember what I seen aboard, you know. And uh, there wasn't nothing much. <laughs> you know, everything they had was either a tattoo of a wall, the ceiling, or the floor. There wasn't nothing laying around. You know, nothing at all, you know. And it looked sterile. It just, it was lit up inside, but it looked sterile sterile as could be and i felt like i was i was safe you know i wasn't scared at all you know <laughs> did you have a good sense of their gender because when i had a, a like a contact with one uh i felt female energy from her so i knew she was female but i couldn't see any gender so uh, okay well that that may have been a real gray i don't know because the clones they have no gender they're not male or female you know, the little three foot tall with the big black eyes. Now, the real grays, as far as I know, through my research and everybody I've talked to, they're usually, uh, you know, four and a half foot tall, maybe five foot tall at the most. And they do have a slight gray to their skin. But the ones I've seen look like Casper the Friendly Ghost. You know, they look white because when they was coming up in my yard, and they got on my roof and leaned over and looked at me after they took the Farleys. I seen them. They was in these skin tight suits, like a diving suit. You know, like a man would put on a diving suit to go underwater. It was that tight. And all I could see was their head, their hands, and their feet. And they looked white. You know, it didn't look gray at all. I could see it. It stood out like Casper, the friendly ghost. Yep. That's amazing. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I, I hear that the, the uh, clones, the worker bees, the three foot tall, that they send out to get people to touch little babies. You know, there is a continuing cycle. They, they took me, they had me touch babies. They came back, they took other people, brought them there, touch the babies, take them back, bring more people, touch the babies. There's a continuing thing so that the, uh, the, uh, Half human, half uh, 
uh, aliens, the babies, have the human touch. Because without the human touch, because they are part human, they'll die. You know, they'll die, you know, of loneliness or whatever. I've heard that before, yeah. Yeah. They had me touch the babies, and I'm not lying, you know. I mean, I was hypnotized, and I told it all, you know. Yeah. Um, We've been at this for almost two hours, uh, Jim. You've got an amazing story, yeah. Yeah. Your recall's excellent. Yeah, you ought to see my hypnosis. You talk about right down to the money, you know. I mean, and, you know, if I can find a way, I'll send it to you, okay? My hypnosis for three hours, I'll get my girlfriend, uh, Brittany Johnson, who's my technician, <laughs> I'll get her to do it for me, okay? Exactly, yeah. Brittany. Yeah, I'd no. like to, sh- yeah, because I don't know how to do this stuff, you know. I, I first got a smartphone, I didn't even know how to work it. Because, you know, when I grew up, we had the rotary dial telephones, and I'd never owned a computer, you know. And I should have by now, and I tried. I did have one one time, and I tried to learn it, but it aggravated me so much, I said, the hell with it. <laughs> I just need to make phone calls, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, thanks again for coming on, Jim. It's been fun. It's been Yeah, good. yeah. And, and, you know, people, anybody who's heard it right, Pat, they know they got stuff. You know, they can't hide this stuff forever. You know, I mean, Nick Pope's on our film, and I talked to Sharon Coborn out in Dallas the other day. And she's finishing up the documentary. It's called Alien Experiencers. And that's all it's called, Alien Experiencers. And hopefully it'll be on uh, on uh, on some, you know, prime whatever, you know. We'll get it on TV. It may be another seven, eight months, but it's going to be on TV. And... Uh, and they're working on it, so it should be done. And I was leading to something else, but then my mind's so far away on everything, I keep forgetting, you know. But I'm getting up there. I'm 68 years old now, you know. But I still get around. I'm a dishwasher in a local restaurant, the Black Pearl in Dunedin, Florida. I might as well get their name out there. It's a, a four or five star restaurant, really fancy waiters and tuxedos. You know, this where you take your woman to romance her and stuff. And I'm a dishwasher there, and I mow lawns and stuff in the mobile home park I live in. And so I stay active. You know, I only weigh 130 pounds. I'm active. I get around like I'm 35. You know, I'm not going to grow old if I don't have to. <laughs> you know? Good stuff. Yeah. Well, thanks again for coming on. And uh, to those watching, hope you enjoyed today's interview. I sure did. Yeah. Your host, Mr. Great. More interviews coming up. And I'll see you guys next time. So Okay. Next time you let me know, we'll do it again. All right. Thanks, buddy. All right. Thank Thank you. everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Mr. Gray. And thanks for watching today's episode. If you are an abductee, contactee, or experiencer, and you believe that your story could help others, please feel free to contact me through my YouTube channel email. When it comes to experiencers, the ET phenomena, and the future, remember, truth will out.